This episode was recorded live at Good Robot Brewery. Good Robot Brewery makes quirky drinks and food experiences for every customer. They even win awards for the chances they take in craft brewing with their unique and rich flavors. There's a beer garden near the Halifax Commons, the brewery, beer store, and beer garden in Elmsdale, and a famously eccentric tap room with, you guessed it, a beer garden on Roby Street. They friggin' love beer gardens. This is truly an incredible business in Nova Scotia, often putting community first with the most amazing staff. And did I mention delicious product to boot? Good Robot Brewery is the real deal. So visit their three locations in Nova Scotia, grab some cans at the NSLC, or visit their website, goodrobotbrewing.ca. And as always, drink responsibly. One and all to another episode of the Friendly Heckler Podcast. Thank you so much for subscribing, liking, sharing, following, sharing it with all of your friends, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to new listeners, hi, hello. I'm your host, Zachary Miller. I'm the friendliest heckler there is. And I hope on this podcast you maybe find some new music. I hope you giggle. Hey, whatever you're doing right this second, I, I hope we can have some fun together. Uh, I want all of the guests on this show to kick back and relax. I want the audience to kick back and relax. Hey, maybe even we all take off our shoes together. Who knows? I want to free ourselves from the restrictions of studio interviews, the usual 20 seconds of banter that people get in between songs. And I want that feeling that comes with getting to know someone or in the jokes or deep conversation that can come from spending lots of time together on stage over songs and dim lighting, which... Now that I say that, it does sound quite romantic. And you, it is, actually. It is. So I want all of those feelings, but live on stage in front of microphones with a real live audience. Is that, maybe that's weird of me. But I hope you get that same feeling from this podcast. And maybe you should even join us as live audience members on some of these upcoming dates. If you live in Bedeck, Cape Breton, I'll be at Stemstock on 420 recording live from that wacky annual party. Or hello, Sydney, Cape Breton, April 21st with Cassie Josephine at Island Folk Cider. Get your tickets for that by emailing me directly at thefriendlyheckler at gmail.com. May 9th, Leona Berkey joins me at the Union Street in Berwick, Nova Scotia. And you can get tickets for that one on their website at theunionstreet.com. June 22nd at the Full Circle Festival in Avondale, Nova Scotia, with a wicked cast of guests. Visit their website for tickets, fullcirclefestival.ca. This being a live-recorded podcast means anything can happen. For example, on this episode, everything that could go wrong before the show did. The electric guitar amp I borrowed failed. We had to swap out the whole PA system within 20 minutes of curtains. Then, as I introduced our guest, her microphone actually failed, meaning... All that to say, in the recording of this po- episode, audio compromises were made. And I wanted to prepare you for some of that audio because, personally, I don't find it ideal. But if you don't notice, then I did my job. Uh, otherwise, feel free to write me all the mean letters you can think of. But you know what? Between all that madness, between my nervous drips of sweat, my guest, Talia Schlanger, was incredibly gracious, kind, and, and helpful Not only did she help me set up and tear down the whole PA system, up three flights of stairs, no less, but she calmed my nerves and eased any fears I had of interviewing such a broadcasting pro. Her career is immense. Between her work touring and theater, her time at NPR and continued work at CBC, or her new job as a touring musician, Talia is busy, but so dedicated to everything she does. Even this live recording, she was so present. And I really appreciated the opportunity to sit down with someone I consider an icon in this realm of sitting behind microphones, but also now in the songwriter and performer realm. Uh, I heavily respect her. Her album, Grace for the Going, is is really amazing. It's a heavy intro for an artist. You should definitely buy that now on apps like Bandcamp or from her website, taliaschlanger.com, link in the show notes. The recordings are incredible, so we talk about the album, its making, 
the stories and the songs, obviously. But we also talk about things like Talia's youth singing musicals around the house. And she absolutely shook the walls with her powerful voice. And doing these songs live was incredible to hear. So without further ado. Everybody, please welcome Talia Schlager. (laughs) Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Like as if it was a bad thing. No, it was like, like uh, why would you open with that song? Yeah, well, I got asked. I would never do that. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's such a powerful song because to me, it's such a like it's like an end of the record goodbye in a way. That's true. You're right. It's towards the very end of the record, and it also is a song that I've been liking opening solo shows with. Mm. And I think it's because it's really sparse. It's really small on the guitar. Kind of gives let gives me a second to sink into the room. Nice. And I also think it's a like when I wrote it, I felt like I was playing with a an idea that was funny to me anyway, the idea of like sitting on a stage or like putting yourself out there in a way and also singing about your right to be forgotten to completely disappear it's like a contradiction that i kind of enjoy in the spotlight yeah saying forget me exactly exactly um does that freak you out to be forgotten in a way no i don't think so i think i very much i tried to be at peace with it actually and i thought about that a lot when i was getting ready to put the record out um judy the there's a lyric in in the song like judy on the judy and the cross and it's um yes i wondered if that was judy sill it is oh awesome good one awesome yeah okay okay zach okay okay uh see we're jumping in let's yeah we're past the weird part yeah it's judy sill for for people who don't know judy sill is like one of the most amazing folk singers Mm. put out two records and was really largely forgotten by music history she was sort of like really hard done by in in the music business and then yeah for for all intents and purposes like forgotten by a lot of people when we talk about the greatest folk singers yeah um so in the in the song it's like kind of just a description of the cover of her album um that is my favorite album of hers but i thought a lot about her rose yeah 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 
um, amber eyes that stare. She's like wearing those like amber kind of tinted glasses and sort of wow. looking at some temple wall in the distance. I don't know. Yeah. So. Is she sort of one of those musical icons to you in terms of her career trajectory too? Like you kind of admire that maybe maybe that she never got her due? Maybe, maybe, or maybe I think like, I don't know if it's that so much as it's like, what is, what is success? What, what, what are we trying, what are we trying Mm. to do here? Like if you're writing songs, what are you actually trying to do? And I think for me, I'm trying to capture some part of the human experience that will mean something to somebody when they hear it. Mm -hmm. And that's enough. Um, and that really has to be enough. And and I hope that that was enough for her. She kind of had a tragic end to her life, and it was very... She died really young, but when you think about... Like, nobody would say she had a successful career, but she's made music that saved my spirit. Wow. And yeah. lots of other people's, too, I think. So that's as meaningful as anything. Yeah. Yeah. Is... Um like we were, we kind of touched on this before when we were talking about Nick Drake before the show. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea of using certain artists that may remind you of darker times in your life because of either their stories and or their just general sound and it's melancholy. And she's sort of one of those people too, in terms of like this the feeling I get from her songs. Yeah, like almost Harry Nilsson too, like this sadness in the voice. So do you use? Do you use music in that way, like therapy, for getting certain emotions out, even with songwriting? Yeah, for sure. I've been thinking, like, I'm staying at a, a weird hippie house right now in Halifax for the for the week. <laughs> Why do you describe it like of, that, by the way? Well, because there's a bunch of people who, did, like, were part of this Music Declares Emergency climate concert. Cool. And, and some of them are doing this, like, songwriting camp that's related to, to climate stuff. And we've been talking a lot. And one of the things that keeps coming up that people keep referring to and, you know, sourcing it to different artists that they've heard from over time is this idea that a song is trying to answer a question for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, I don't know if I think necessarily that, like, good art or art that I'd want to share is... That, that that goes in hand with the therapeutic aspect of it. Like I do a lot of writing that's for my own sort of working out of things that I would never, ever play in front of people that you don't deserve to be subjected to. Okay. Um, but there definitely is a, a therapeutic aspect to, to looking at a question and sort of like turning it around in different sides. And I think that when I write, one of the freedoms that I try to give, or there's a couple of freedoms that I try to give myself. One is that a song is allowed to be as terrible as it needs to be. Nice. Because nobody has to hear it. It's fine. And then the other one is that I'm allowed to look at any part of myself or any thought that comes up or feeling that comes up or image that comes up and not judge it. Like I can just get it on the page, see what it sounds like in a song, worry about it later. Okay. And I think that that's a valuable form of therapy too because sometimes we're scared to look at parts of ourselves and it's like it's like okay whatever they're there you know yes so as a song do you know what i mean oh yeah Yeah. because uh, as a songwriter you're still looking inwards for a lot of your material then eh? for sure both i think though because there's a lot of songs on the record that have started with the idea of somebody else or a creature or... I was just thinking about this. Cause, <laughs> okay, can we talk about that one? Yeah, sure. Because I, I imagine that's the song you played at Music Declares Emergency. It is. It is. You're talking about the endling. Yeah. The song that's about the frog named Tuffy. It's about... Okay. <laughs> is that what hit you when you read the story? You were like, Tuffy? Tuffy needs a song. Actually, yeah. The <laughs> Fair enough. With the name of Tuffy, that's sweet. So Tuffy is, um, there's, I don't know if anybody's into the Guardian newspaper. Um, Ooh, woo! Such a fan. <laughs> For customers who enjoy public radio will probably enjoy the Guardian newspaper. Um, <laughs> and they're really ahead of the curve on on writing about climate stuff and the, the language that they use. Like they were calling it, you know, a, while a lot of other media outlets um, say climate change, they say climate emergency or climate crisis. Like they're, they're a little bit less afraid to, to talk about the urgency. And there was an article in The Guardian that came out in 20... 16, maybe, the article? I don't know. I read a few years later. And the headline was, Frog Goes Extinct, Media Yawns. 
<laughs> oh, yes. Um, yeah, okay. Which is an amazing headline <laughs> um, in a newspaper, right? Like there's so much built in uh, irony and, and fun there. But, um, and it was an article about Tuffy, who is the world's very last Rab's fringe limbed tree frog, which is a kind of frog that's native to Panama. Wow. And he died in a conservation facility in Georgia. And there's this guy called Mark Mandica, a conservationist who was trying to save Tuffy, worked with him for years. Um, and his son, his like little kid, named the frog Tuffy. Um, oh. Yes. And Tuffy had this like very distinct, very distinct call, um, just could, like other... Sorry, go ahead. Could you do it? I couldn't if I tried. Does anybody want to do a... Because we're taping a podcast and there is a lot of sound happening, does anybody want to take a guess as to what a rab's fringe-limbed tree frog sounds like? Tree frog? Incredible. I don't know if that's accurate, but I did love hearing it. Um, I'll, t- I'll tell you what. I will, for the sake of that person who is willing to make that sound, yeah. I will find the actual sound of the frog and yeah. put it in so that it sounds like a pitch-perfect impersonation. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. You know what? You can actually, there's a recording of him on YouTube. Okay. And this is like, okay, this is nerdy. I don't know how long I'm supposed to talk about this stuff. but I want to know just, about the frog. I, you wrote a song about it. I was really impressed. So he, there's, a vid, there's a clip of the sound on YouTube. Beautiful. And when I was making the record, I was like, I wonder if there's a way that we can incorporate the sound of Tuffy into the music because like the song is really about what does it mean to lose a sound forever? Like I thought Mm -hmm. a lot about, you know, this, this frog is extinct. We're never going to hear that sound again, as far as we know. So what is it when a sound just, so we, we thought about using it and so then I got in touch with Mark Mandica, who oh. recorded this sound, to ask him for permission to like use a piece of the that's, frog call. That's and complicated. We didn't end up using the yeah, I know we didn't end up using the call, but but he and I struck up a friendship, and um, and I got to thank him for all of his work, and also we we made um, we made Tuffy T-shirts. Like my friend, my dear friend, oh, illustrated so him. And we printed them on secondhand shirts, and we're sending a portion of the proceeds to the Amphibian Foundation nice. that was started by Mark Manica. So it's like, That's it's, beautiful. it's become a whole thing. I, the, the frog has come to mean so much to me, but it also, like, it's, he's a bigger metaphor for, you know, or not a, I don't know if metaphor is right, but he's, he's an ambassador, I think, for, for yeah. a lot of feel, feelings that I think a lot of us are feeling about just like the collective gr- gr- grief of, of creatures that are suffering of all kinds or I, many kinds. I was, it made me think when I heard your song, I was like, every creature that goes extinct should be given a requiem of sorts. Like, mm. we should hire a writer to be like, y- you get to write this song, or it's like saying goodbye. If they wrote a song for Princess Diana, I think a frog gets a song. That's you know? an interesting idea, like a song for every <clears throat> creature. Yes. That's we're gonna be very busy. We're uh, it's a, true. Yeah, a it's every day. To, that's a lot to do. Well, it's the only way to save the music industry. Maybe we flip it around, and the only way to save, <laughs> the, only way to save the music industry. <laughs> we're now we're now exploiting these extinct animals yeah. to save our candle. Dying. Five thousand candles in the wind, or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> little Sebastian. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And it seems to me oh. you lived your life. Like a froggy in the wind. Tuffy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see this shirt. Tuffy lives. That's it's here. Beautiful. I have a few. There's okay. like, there, anyway. Yeah, he, he, he does live in me. And I think about, I mean, I think about him every day. And I sing a song. I think about him all the time. So this song is called The Endling? Yeah, the word endling, I should explain, means the last creature of a species before extinction. Oof. With a capital L, too, in the middle, eh? I put that there because everybody who was reading it when I was doing like the masters of the record and working on it, everybody was saying the ending and <laughs> yeah, yeah. because it's endling. endling yeah. yeah. It's such an easy mistake to make. And as a, actually I did it for other radio hosts, like as a radio host myself, I know if I'm reading something in a jiffy, maybe I'll miss a lowercase L. So I just put the L in capitals just to make, just to make it easy for other folks. Endling. Endling. Kelly Schenger with endling. <clears throat> nice. The last time we heard you You were calling out Over the canopy Harmony held you 
carried your name through the trees. Now there's only an echo where your lullaby used to be. And the leaves wonder where you went Every time they try to sleep Long gone the daughter who left you in water The son of a saw seed of tone There in the cavity With nothing to eat You fought to grow limbs of your own And yours would have done the same Never came around. You are the end, the ending of a sound. you from meeting a sixth and final fate. A race to the bottom before you're forgotten, before it's too late. of quiet ten years and four walls and for all your weight is worth carry your body bury three hundred million spins of wisdom burned in earth one To a lover deep underground You are the end ending, The ending of a sound
That sounds so fun. Thanks. <laughs> It sounds so fun to sing like that. You have such crazy power. Oh, thanks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Seriously, I can't believe this is your first record, dude. Like, these are crazy mature songs, oh, too. Thanks. Thanks, thanks. Seriously, that's heavy content to deal with, so I respect it. But that even the, the power of your voice on the record is something else. I feel like I've never heard anybody come out so strong. Hmm. I guess you've been using your voice for Thank many you. years. And you have a theater background, too, right? Yeah. Is that where you learn to stretch your voice a bit? And For sure. First of all, thanks for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, Please. Yeah. Who, who wouldn't say that after well. that song? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I started. I started in theater when I was a kid. I was did community theater. Um, What's your first show that you did? Do you remember? Okay, well, first unofficial show was singing all of Les Mis on the couch, running <laughs> back and forth on the couch of my parents' living room when I was like five. Um, but <laughs> amazing, dressing in rags, running around the house totally. too. Awesome, just okay. like singing way inappropriate songs for a child to be singing about <laughs> French. the French Revolution. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, beautiful. <laughs> Um, yeah, first real show was was doing Annie when I was in school. Sweet. Yep. Yeah. 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 As Annie. <sighs> yeah. Holy shit, that's huge. Well, thank okay. you. It it it's been hard to beat that moment. Um, I don't know if I ever will, but you know. So those songs are really ingrained in your head, eh? Oh, big time. Could you kick out Hard Knock Life right now? No. Okay. I, I mean, I could. Okay, okay. Will I? <laughs> I won't make you. I won't make you. But that's giving me a really funny, like, tactile. Actually, that's giving me, like, a really funny sense memory of, like, learning the choreography and having to, like, with rags on the stage floor, like, oh, like, like remembering time. that as a kid. And also, I had to wear a very, I mean, it's a very silly red <laughs> wig. But the this is like a legendary story in my family that I haven't thought of for a while, but there was a somersault that I had to do at like a really pivotal moment of the show. I can't remember <laughs> what a moment it was, but of course I did the somersault and I arose but the wig did not and it was on the floor yes. and then i like, couldn't find it and then my mic was all funky and then i was just, like f- this like a 10 year old kid just like fumbling for a wig and trying to put it back on the head <laughs> anyway yeah i love it when things go wrong though it did instill in me a great love of things going a little bit wrong when you're like live because it just like it will uh, never happen again you know yes right yes you know you, you host did... a live podcast i, l- I love it i can't get enough of it i want yeah. the moments give me them that's right. <laughs> Eat but you the never, moments. Yeah. I will. I will consume every moment we we have tonight. Eat them all. Um, <laughs> not until I'm four. <laughs> Did you not get into improv then? You never went like that route, eh? I never went the improv route, but you know what? Um, when I was living in Philly, I have this is a story Ooh. that I haven't told actually. In when I was living in Philly, I was hosting a radio show there called World Cafe, and <laughs> I was like. Well, thanks. I was, I was interviewing artists and kind of having a bit of a life moment of like uh, something is something is not right here. I like I, I, something is missing. And the answer eventually ended up being that I needed to get back to singing. But one of the things that that set me free was taking an improv class, cool. like a super beginner level improv class, because I needed I had the like instinct to do it. And I was like, Ugh, I don't really want to do this. I don't think I'm going <laughs> to like this. But I forced myself to do it to be bad at something nice wow yeah and like that because why because you were so good at everything else you put your mind to it like <laughs> just teasing no but that's funny but like not at all i was yeah. wretchedly it was actually because i was wretchedly hard on myself about everything mm. else and everything else felt like it was so important and like it had to be right all the time right. and i felt so much pressure interviewing these artists like it was like the most important thing and it's like yeah it's super important that you make sure that you do your job in a way that you're proud of but it's also zero important at all in the grand scheme of things interesting yeah and i think like doing improv class like just get having the license to just be so bad at something um shook something loose in my mind about creativity and and what i actually kind of needed to do next it's very helpful did you just do the one class i did two level i worked my way through two levels oh wow the classes were like maybe it was like four or five months a semester. So I did two That's of them amazing. in a row. Yeah. It was so fun. I was not good at it at all. Oh, come on. But did you get some writing material out of it though? You must have. Maybe I did. I got the courage to leave my job. So that was wow. the 
thing that led to the writing material. There is thing. something like people who are really deep into improv. Are there any improvisers in here tonight? I know there's some sweet improv scenes in Halifax. Are there? No, no. But the people who are deep into improv, like it, there is this religious aspect of it where it's like you you can change your life by by believing in every moment and just taking a chance in any moment like that's right and the collective unconscious of all getting on that wavelength together wow that's beautiful stuff that's right there's a lot of like human parts of it that are super useful and like the principle of it is that you say yes yeah, that you say yes to everything and it's not it. like in a goofy positive like everything's great kind of way you but say it's like, yes and to yes everything. and yes yeah, sorry sorry <laughs> that's right say yeah yes you say and yes life. and and it's like it, it that is like an ex- there's a great acceptance in that you're like oh, okay this is what is this is the premise that you're putting out there and what What's next? Yeah, oh, you're the right. Discomfort. Zach. You're the and to to my yes. Right oh, now. that's sweet. Thank you that's for... sweet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll be the butt end of the joke tonight, anytime no. if you need to. Yeah, no, bail on like totally. Just no. throw me under the bus if you need to. No, no, I wouldn't I, do that. I, wouldn't I, do I that. work as that character in the in the sketch, you okay. know. The Schlemiel and the Schlemazel. <laughs> a rare bird who can be both Schlemiel and Schlemazel. It's beautiful. Yeah, guy. I think so. That's beautiful. Say that on your business card. <laughs> That's uh, Spite Yodeler and Schlemiel Schlemazel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, as I said, though, what a crazy record to come out with. And the band you have on this record is nuts. They're How did nuts. you connect with all this entire band? They, it makes no sense whatsoever to me. So uh, the we really made it during like deep, deep COVID mm. t- times, um, and because of that, a lot of I mean, I I started re- recording in earnest at the in like the first summer of COVID, and then I rewrote and edited everything, and like kind of used all that time to to gut all the material and and work on it, okay. whatever. But because it was because people weren't touring, a lot of people were around, and so mm. we just kind of asked whoever we wanted to play. And my producer David Traversmith is an angel beyond angels, and like the secret sauce of all of this, and he. There were a couple people he suggested, um, Davide Dorenzo, who's the drummer on the record, who's like such an emotional and and special drummer. And, you know, I went to Davide's house and like into his basement. We were wearing masks and we just kind of played some stuff together to feel each other out as people. And then he came on board and Kevin Bright, who is one of the best guitarists, like, absolutely period ever. A crazy monster on the monster. And he did a bunch of stuff. And then Brian Kobayakawa, like I met him years ago at a friend's show bass player and just asked him. And then some other people were just like my favorite instrumentalist who I just wrote to and I hadn't asked. heard the name Jaron Freeman Fox in years until I saw him on your record. I was like, wow, I forgot about that name. Jaron is, uh, yeah, he plays the violin and the viola d'amour on the record and does also some like subharmonic singing too, which is crazy. Oh. He is the cool, he's so cool. I've been a fan of his for so long and I know him through my cousin Susie who's like big in the folk scene in Toronto and she's an amazing singer and songwriter and painter and everything and and he was always around at her place and at parties and I just seen him play a lot and he um made one of my favorite ever instrumental records so I wrote him and then but now the the people are like we made the album together but now we play live shows together which is the whole band you've gotten the whole band together for the release and everything in Toronto yeah Dick Jaron played at it and Anne Fung who plays flute um on the album who's also like uh, Mind blowing. She she came out and played, and and Kevin and Davide and Brian and I played together as much as we can. So wow. I don't know, man. It's I got really 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 lucky, and wow. uh, it feels yeah. I feel just lucky, and I feel like I. It's n- it's not very cool to have imposter syndrome to this degree, but I'm just like I, I fight it all the time when I play with them. But they're so hmm. kind, and they make me feel so. Uh, they're so familial about playing together that it makes that part go away. The pressure's kind of shit off. Yeah. Eh? Of like you're not, you're playing with your peers rather than your idols. Yeah. We just go to the music place together and then cool. that's it. Yeah. Elevate. Do you, have you felt that lifting off the stage feeling with them? For sure. Oh, cool. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You've played some unbelievable shows on, on this run too, even in Halifax alone. So we mentioned the music declares emergency show yeah which was an award show as well yeah so they're really getting this off the ground and i think it's going to happen again next year um it's in 
this year was in honor of Joni Mitchell and Neil Young and right. the contributions that they've made, even beyond the protest music that they've written, just as people to climate activism. And so everybody who took part in the concert did one of their own songs and then also did a Joni or Neil cover. Nice. Um, and that was at the Rebecca Cohen Theater, which is such an amazing space. Beauty. And like some heavy, heavy folks played. This musician, Alexi Campagne, did pos- What's happening Are there here? shots coming up to the stage? Wow. Think, did somebody buy us shots in here? Did somebody buy and send us shots? Did, it's just somebody. I bought you shots. Daisy! Daisy. Wow! Daisy's the best! What? Thank you, Thank Daisy. You. Should That's we really do nice. them? Is yeah, that how should, this works? Absolutely, sure. Do you have a word that you say? I mean, you lived, you recorded some of this in Spain, so I imagine you have some cool drinking traditions. There. To be honest, I'm going to say l'chaim. From my l'chaim. Jewish culture, I'm going to say l'chaim, which means to life, which I think we can all use that sentiment right to now. To life. L'chaim. L'chaim. Yeah. Mm. Ooh. For people listening well, on you. the podcast right now, that was just water. Yeah, we only shoot water. That's how it works in Halifax. We shoot water, baby. Yeah. Also, I'm taking off my shoes. That, that's good for the podcast listeners. Today. I know. I feel like I should tell them. I'm confessing it, but you're I'm not the socks. first. You're not the first. I Cuz I really want to sit cross-legged cuz I'm not used to playing this electric guitar sitting down, so I'm like Oh, do you want to stand? No, is no, that, this that is make grand. you more comfortable? No, okay. this is good. Yeah. I want to make sure you're comfortable. We're just, we're both figuring the stage out tonight. This yeah. is an incredible venue, too. We're, we're it's really great. glad to we be here. It's great. We love it here. Is everybody doing okay out there? Yeah. yeah? For now. What a cool crowd. Talking about sitting, I was like, for now, I can sit cross legged. Yeah, like, I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you wow. said you're doing okay for now. I was like, okay, all right. Oh, geez, yeah. This moment, I can sit cross legged, but like tomorrow, maybe not. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, well, we're being spoiled. Thanks for the shots. Thank, thank you, you for talking with us. What a great audience. And thank yeah. you for being so comfortable with me. I feel like we're in one of our living rooms right now. Definitely. So here, I actually wore a big hat tonight because you. I thought you were going to wear a big hat. So. Oh, shoot. But I'll tell you I what. I was going to. I threatened to I'll wear a big hat, off. but I didn't. You know. Look at that. There now we're go. all comfortable. Now we're all wearing Is our everybody socks. gonna take their shoes off? Let's everybody? make it this kind of podcast. Can we get So I see somebody hey, taking their shoes yeah. off. That's the nightmares in the audience. I that, love oh, this. The first episode of the podcast where everybody had their, shoes, their off. shoes off. No, that's a lie. My father in law. We all had our shoes off because oh, yeah? it was recorded at my house. Yeah. yeah. That's good. And he's a radical dude, so we have <laughs> It's to pretty radical. Blew my <laughs> shoes off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where else where else should we go? We've talked about your theater background, which I feel like I could geek out on all night. And I just wanna I want to ask you about all the crazy interviews you've done because sure. your career is amazing. But oh, I don't want to talk about interviewing all night because I'm sure. Well, I, I should give you the opportunity right now to Billy Bob Thornton this interview and just, <laughs> just. Uh, oh yeah, just say you're not actually allowed to ask me anything. Yeah, I don't want to talk. Interviewer, I said it says interview. it in my writer. My agent told you. <laughs> yeah. My publicist told you. <laughs> yes. If you want, because I could talk about the interviewing all that. Actually, do you have any tips for interviewers? Like, what are the first tips you got that you were like, whoa, that changed my whole world sitting in an interview with somebody? So, first of all, you're doing great. You're great at this. Whoa, what I'm about to you. say is something that you already do. I, I think, um, like, my favorite people that I listen to in interview with the people that I look up to and like to learn from, you can tell that they have a plan when they go in and that they're totally open to something way more interesting happening in the moment that they mm-hmm. never planned for. And the ability to follow that instinct and, and to like constantly be asking yourself like, okay, what's the most interesting, what's the most interesting thing we could talk about right now? Not what did I come in here wanting to talk about, but what is really, truly interesting? Um, is great. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. I also love, like, I also really love, and I try to do this all, I tried to do this all the time when I was interviewing more and I still try to, is it's so awesome to hear somebody say that they don't understand what something means and just ask the other person to clarify. Yeah. Cause I also feel like I took that super seriously, especially at World Cafe. Cause sometimes there's like a snobbery that people feel like you have to know every band or you have to know every <laughs> word or you have to, you know, know every concept or politician or whatever. Yeah. And if you don't know, like I always thought to myself, I don't know as the interviewer, 
I'm not alone. Other people who are listening also probably don't know. And then I can model that it's like very okay to just say like, I don't understand what you mean. Can you explain? Or, oh, I've never heard that word before. Um, So that's one of my favorite things and something that my heroes do really well. Yeah, Yeah. admitting a little ignorance. Or just just the fact that no, not everybody knows everything. I don't know. Yes. Like, yes. Terry Gross is amazing at doing that. Tom Power is amazing at doing that. Tom's, yeah. you know, he's my colleague sometimes, but he's also one of my, um, one of the people that I look up to as an interviewer. And he's so great at saying, can you say more about that? Can you, what do you mean? Can you explain yeah. that? And what, it's great. How do you feel about the expression, unpack that? <gasps> that's so funny that you asked that. I feel like that's used on radio so much these days. In, you have baggage. Let's unpack that. In one of my, <laughs> in one of my first interviews that I did at World Cafe, this artist who I'm not going to name was, was kind of like most of the time people are so nice and open. And this person was probably having a bad day. And I, in my like newbiness, was like, can you unpack that? And she was like, oh, I've never heard that one before. Oh my God. She, she was like, we must like be on public radio if we're going to unpack that. That. And uh, and I was so I felt so embarrassed, and then I tried not to use it again. But sometimes that's the word that you need to use. Did people treat you like an, a noob in the industry when you first started like that? People in Philly were hilarious. They were first of all they were so kind and so welcoming, yeah. but also I was filling in. I took over for a man who had been hosting a show for almost thirty years. Incredible daily show, same time slot every day for almost thirty years. So people, his voice was an institution. People were very used to it in their day, and every single person that I met for the entire three years that I was there was like. Oh, you got some big shoes to fill. <laughs> and at, like, After the, point, the first year, come on. The, like, I, I think I had already like quit my job and then still met somebody at our festival and they were like, wow, you got some big shoes to fill. And I was like, actually, I'm, I'm, walking, <laughs> I'm walking away in these shoes now at this point. It's been almost three years. Yeah. But it's true. I mean, he was amazing and, and it takes people a minute to catch up. But for the most part, everyone was like, very welcoming and, and it was often a joke. Mm. Like, I just took it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, people are saying that now that you're, you're gone though. People are saying, Hey, you got big shoes to fill. No Let's way. Tell your shoes. I'm sure they're not. I'm sure they're like, Tell you has small feet and she <laughs> takes her shoes off often. You'll be fine. <laughs> That's true. We are sitting here without our shoes. Though. <laughs> you actually have no shoes to fill. <laughs> Boom! Roasted. <laughs> what an incredible job. Actually, when you started guest hosting on Q, too, because what? when did you start at Q? Well, I guest hosted for a tiny little bit before I left for Philly. So, okay. like, a little bit in 2015 or 16 and that was actually how I ended up getting my job in Philly somebody heard me on Q that's awesome yeah it was really nice so I'd only done like a week or two before before I left and then started doing it like on a more regular basis after Mm. after I left Philadelphia um, and in 2020 and now I kind of bop in when they need me and it's so fun to do and then bop out you're, right. you're so good at it, honestly. Oh, you thank one, you. I'm, not, I'm not just saying that because you're sitting here, but like when you started guest hosting, I was like, give her the job. This show no. has gone through so many changes that you are fantastic at it. Thank and I, you. I hope CBC considers offering you a ridiculous amount of money for a, for a show full time. <laughs> Someday, when you're ready to come back, when you're like, yeah, you know, Thanks. I could do music and host all the time. That's very nice. One thing I will say is that show has the most amazing producers, and they're so smart. Good and team. It's a, oh, my God, it's a dream team. Like, you walk in, you're like, oh, wow, a bunch of smart people have already thought about a bunch of very thoughtful things, and now I get nice. to be part of that. It's great. Right. You get to verbalize it all yeah. and take the credit. Exactly. Awesome. Exactly. <laughs> Give them none of it. I'm just kidding. I'm just Say, kidding. I had all of these ideas myself. I Can we, this um... introduction myself. <laughs> no, they're awesome. Can we talk about a song? Actually, when I heard this song, I kind of thought it might be about some of your radio experiences. Uh-huh. But when then... When I've heard you talk about the album a bit, I'm wondering where the song came from. And you don't have to break the magic of it, but Attention oh, yeah. is such a cool song. Thanks. Great rhythm to it. Great message. It is cheeky, which I really enjoy. <laughs> I like Thanks. cheeky songs. And it feels like a good like slap in the face to somebody. So I, I don't want you to break the magic of it. But I imagined when I was listening to it, because there's a line where you say... Um, you like the sound of your name in my mouth. Yeah. And I thought that was like amazing because I imagined sitting in the chair across from you being one of these like totally self-involved people like, oh, Talia, my life in Venice is just so hard sometimes. <laughs> Say my name again, please. Who are you? So I kind of imagine it being about your guests sometimes, but 
I don't want to break the magic of it. Will you play attention and maybe people can take what they want from it? Sure. I love that. And that's such a cool take. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll leave it. I'll, I'll leave, it, leave it there. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. Oh, thanks. That's cool. Oh. You know what? Let's make sure that we have the most, the most E-E that there ever was. <laughs> uh, an uh, eh. An uh. That was just a tiny bit sharp and I, we, I can do better for you. That's okay. I appreciate you tuning. This is the kind of show, too, folks, where I don't like to cut things out. I like the reality of it. So whatever happens, happens well, tonight. Everybody can know that originally that note was sharp, but now it's not. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, where did it come from for you? Okay, well, we can demystify it now. It was okay. So, oh, thank you. The <laughs> truth is <sighs> that I was. It was the last song that I wrote for the record. Oh wow! Yep. Late and entry. I know it was like a little. I feel. I felt like I needed something a little zippy. And somebody <laughs> nailed it. I just gave like the ee spicy zippy. <laughs> Yeah, zippy. Somebody kind of did me a little bit wrong in the dating department, and okay. they then they wrote wrote me a, a text message that said, "Can we go back to being friends?" And <laughs> that's a, I love the reaction right up front. I know. Ah. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I said. I said to be. I mean, honestly, we were never friends. <laughs> So that's the lyric, yeah. Make no mistake about it. I was never your friend. Awesome. I had something you needed. Um, and so, and that was, it was a bit mean, but it was very true. And I think that's okay. And so that's where, that's where like the initial seed came from. Um, and then the attention is oxygen is like, yes, th- this person w- was very, very self-involved in, in a way that 
felt a little bit icky, but then it became kind of a mantra as in like the things that you pay attention to. When you pay attention to something, you're breathing life into it. Mm -hmm. The things that you pay attention to become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so then it sort of became like a cool thing that I liked thinking of for myself. Like, okay, what am I, what am I giving oxygen to? And am I choosing that? Or or is this just like a, a weird loop? And, and, um, so then it became about a bunch of things and then it, and it also has the title from the record grace for the going in it. I saved my grace for the going, which came from actually when I was living, leaving Philadelphia and I was like, a lot of things were ending all at once. I left my job and left a, um, a relationship and I had to leave the city. And I was kept thinking to myself, like, please have grace in the going, like be gracious as you go. Don't, don't forget to like be gentle and gracious through a big change with yourself not just with everybody else oh good question zach hey hey see this is a great interviewer right here <laughs> hey because <laughs> that's, that's right that's... stop i'm gonna go so red right now and then it's all i'm gonna be thinking about this no but that's a that's exactly that's exactly it that's always the last the the last thought for me anyway is working you? on that yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, let me be gracious towards everybody else, and then you forget to have it for yourself. Or I have a lot. I don't have know. Have you if always I, are, put... Are there people sorry. like that? No, no, no. Sorry, go ahead. We're both... <laughs> We're both massively <laughs> Canadian. <laughs> do you want to do, do the thing where we say something at the, at same, the same time, time that, that we want to say before? before? <laughs> <laughs> that we'd say something that we'd never seen before. <laughs> it works. It yeah. does work. We're, we're getting there. We'll start our improv troupe in two years, folks. And then you should come out to our two-person show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're at it right now. <laughs> no, but do you, do you generally put others first? Have you always been like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because people would assume, like, radio hosts are like Fraser Crane. They're, like, solely self-involved. That's so Love funny. to listen to your own voice. Yeah. That's so funny. No, I think the kind of hosting I do is truly all about handing over a platform to somebody else and giving them, like trying to shape things in a way that lets them really show themselves to an audience. And, Mm. and, and, uh, yeah, for me, it's not that, I don't think, I hope not. I I feel like you've gotten, you're the only person I know who's come into the music is an industry. I hate saying the word industry. Former guests have called me out on this. Um, but you're the first person I know who's come into it all with like this stacked binder of tips and information and guidance from all the most amazing people who have ever been through it. Everyone living at least. So do you feel like you're coming into the industry with like a level head and some good tips and guidance for it? Or... Do you feel like you're still free, free falling and every day is new? Well, there's two parts to that. Like there's the art part, which like there's the art part and there's the business part. Yeah. So on the art part of things, I do feel like I've gotten to, I've had the like lucky chance of being in the room with some of the greatest people who make art Mm -hmm. and ask them questions about how they do it. And that is crazy to me. Like I've gotten to soak in, um, tips and, and ideas about process and musicality from, from legends. And that feels super lucky. So I do feel like a very lucky leg up in that regard. Cause I have a deep well to, to pull from in, in hearing stories from people. And then on the business side, a hundred percent not. I could never have ever expected what it actually is okay. to make a record and then to try to get it out, distribute it, put it on the internet, survive while you're doing that, get places and play it mm. for people and, and live like that part of things. I never really asked people about cause I never thought that was that interesting, but holy okay. fucking shit. Like <laughs> it's blowing my mind. Ma- it's, I'm sort of trying to look at it like a, an anthropologist, like rather than being so personally invested and being like, this is my art and what's happening with it. Just trying to like so? zoom out a little bit and be like, okay, this is how a person who makes music, uh, puts it out and markets it and sells things. And like, like just trying to have a little bit of distance. Cause otherwise it's crazy making, like it's so overwhelming. Yeah. Is it, that was the longest answer ever to your question, but well, that's where I'm at because I'm just doing all this for the first time. But I feel honest. like, I, yeah, because my question's three-pronged, really, because mm-hmm. it goes back to you. You have to put yourself forward. 
mm-hmm. now for the first time. If you're not thinking about everyone right. else and you're looking after yourself, is it weird selling yourself like that? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's so weird. But you also freelance as like a journalist and as a radio host, right? So Yeah, it's all freelance. Help? Yeah. Yeah, it's all freelance now. Like I haven't been an employee uh, anywhere since the fall of 2019. So that's like Amazing. almost it's like four and a half years. Yeah. Free, it's... But it's different when you're like working with a skill that is more based in serving other people. Um, like I think, yeah, it's a it's definitely a different struggle to be like, oh, okay, this is this is this is my art, and what's it what's it worth? And that's also so different from sharing it. Like when I play songs for people, like my intention is so simple, and it's just that somebody would get something that they need from listening to the music. That's it. Period. Always. And that's completely separate from the business part of things that is, like, very right. weird. Right. Is there a time of day for business? Like, is it, like, uh, the hours are, like, 9 to 3, and then 3 to 9 p.m. is music? That's a good question. I'm trying to shift the balance back because I just put the record out last month. Like, we're speaking in March, and I put it out in February. Um, it's been a, a lot more on the business side and a lot less on the art side, so I need to shift the balance back. It's a weird, it's a very weird mm. feeling because it's a bit like, oh, what's it for, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's always those nights on stage where you're like, why am I here? Or you get halfway through a song and you're like, you zone out. And oh, then yeah. you realize how you're not in the moment or, and business is kind of looming. Maybe. Well, that's where yeah. I like, I'm try to be really intentional about that. Never creeping into performance stuff. Mm. Like I tr- really am trying hard. Maybe once I've done it for longer, that will happen. But so far, like the best part is getting to share the songs with people. Cause it's like, Oh, none of the other stuff is happening. Like the, the real reason is happening now. Yeah. And then we'll save that for later. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? On that note. Thanks for being part of it. No, it actually is like massively meaningful to me that to show up in a different province um, and like get to share stuff with people. So thank you all so much for Yay. being here and supporting music. It means a lot. It really does. Yeah. Live audiences could save the entire music industry, almost more so than animals going extinct. I think live <laughs> audiences could be more important, possibly. Uh, do you want to play me another song? I heckled you for one. Well, you, actually, I heckled you for a couple. Yeah. Well, you get to choose this one. I get to choose this one. Maybe I've been talking a lot, and I don't want to play another one that has like a big story now. So maybe I'll just do so small. Just Do So Small. That's well, maybe a I'll, powerful maybe tune. Just Do So Small. I love this song. Actually, is, do you mention thumbs in this song? I think you do. Yeah. Yeah. Posable. Wait, no. It, that's in Nobody. But there's, there's a, a lyric about opposable thumbs. There's yeah. a couple of lyrics about thumbs in this record. Oh, I do sing about thumbs in this song, see? too. Yeah. See, it's. I noticed there's a couple. And it made me think, like, were you fighting with the trying not to be on your phone thing when you were writing this? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Um... Maybe. I fight... Oh, did my mic go away? Oh, did I it? I think it did. Oh, it's oh. back. I fight with phones all the time. If I had my... Like, yeah, I'm not very good at tech, and I, I, I don't love it. Um, and I don't love the hold that it has on me, but... In, oh, really? No. You fight with that? For sure. In the context of this song, though, the, the lyric is ricochet from thumb to thumb while watching the weeks pass. Um, and... Uh, what I really I'm, like that. Oh, thanks. It makes it sound fun, actually, to be on your <laughs> phone for, uh, for days. <laughs> what um, what I think I meant by that one in this song is um, ricochet from thumb to thumb, like the the things that we use to soothe ourselves throughout the day. Oh. Like sucking your thumb, right? Yeah. Like you wake up and it's like, okay, what's the next thing that's going to soothe me? Coffee. After that, what's going to soothe me? Looking at my phone and seeing if somebody has written me a nice email. Hmm. After that, what's the, like, so thumb to thumb. And, and you can, like, live your whole life kind of from thumb to thumb oh, like of that. things that are giving you, you know, sort of false comfort. Is that just an expression you came up with personally? Thumb to thumb kind of thing? Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I don't know. That. Maybe some, probably somebody else smarter did, but. Uh. Living thumb to thumb is beautiful. Thanks. Sitting at the table on a t-
Tuesday drawn in gray scale in the first week of a brand new year. Thinking how unlikely that despite the war outside me and inside me, I'm still here. The ink stains all the same, whether someone And if this is what remains, well then it must be what I chose. And now the sunlight seeping in, threatening to wake the walls, saying you are so big, you are so small. from thumb to thumb while watching the weeks pass I have torn my corners I have loved from skin to glass I have prayed for patience like an enemy of time and I have begged for freedom from the meter in my mind but the ink stains all the same whether someone comes or goes and if this is what remains well then it must be what I chose and now the sunlight seeping in threatening to wake the walls saying you are so big you are so That is how I know that it is separate from me. And now the sunlight seeping in, threatening to wake the walls. Saying you are so big, you are so curious how you'd pull off the ending too because is there a cool effect on the record does it go through a leslie cabinet or something there's like this really cool or did you do that in studio no way oh thanks wow <laughs> er thanks daisy <laughs> everybody nice. give daisy a round of applause because she's the most amazing bartender i've ever seen She's the best. Thanks, Daisy. I'm surprised more people aren't storming the stage right now, actually. Cause... <laughs> That's so sweet. <laughs> no, no. No, not at all. Thank you. That's okay. They, they, that recording has such a cool... Like, the vocals are amazing throughout the entire record again. Thank you. But is there an effect on that song? Because the ending, it feels like it has this, like... Yeah, yeah. I think that David put like some sort of echo effect that's like slightly in time with it. But like then there's Leslie also like, cabinet? oh, I don't know. Because you just Leslie. replicated it like perfectly. I think I just sang. Like I think I just sang it like that, and then that's, the, awesome. that's the thing. And then I did all the backing vocals too, which was the most fun ever thing. It was like the last thing that we added to the record, and we were gonna bring somebody else in to do them. And then I was like, you know what? I think I kind of want to just sit in my 
apartment and record a bunch of different vocal parts that I hear in my head and see if we can do it. And then that's how we, we did it. Whoa. When my cats, I was fostering kittens and, uh, when, <laughs> when the kittens would nap, <laughs> I would like take, take a couple of hours of like kitten silence to record <laughs> <laughs> vocal harmonies. It was really, really cute. <laughs> in your lap while you were singing? Too? Yeah. Or like on the little cat tree bes- beside my head <laughs> atop the tree. Yeah. That's very cute. Were you just making up the harmonies as you went sort of? Yeah. That's Ooh. one thing that like the theater background helped with a lot because I, when I was doing theater, um, for a living, like one of the things that I did was I was always a like double understudy. So I did a few contracts where I was like in the ensemble eight shows a week. And then I was also understudying two of the leads. And that meant you had to learn three different harmony parts for anything that you were in, right. For like any of the ensemble numbers. So you'd have like a good understanding of how different harmony parts stack and fit together. And, Hmm. um, it was really fun. And I think that, like I got to work with some really cool arrangers, like Tom Kitt arranged um, American Idiot that I did on tour, and we got cool. to work with him a little bit. And hearing the way that he put crunchy harmonies together really like help help me think through my own stuff. Were those songs that you already kind of knew anyway, like the some Green of the Green Day, Day, Day material? Yeah, okay. totally. But did, Green Day was like my first album that I bought with my own money. Really? Yeah. Do- Dookie. Dookie? Dookie? Yeah. yeah, sweet. Oh wow, that's crazy. Dookie fans. <laughs> Yeah, okay. They See, they don't want to admit it. That's okay. Yes. No, it's cool. Come on. Yeah, that yeah. album was very Every, cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Okay, that's the first album you bought with your own money. I yeah. thought you were going to say, like, Pippin or something. Pippin? <laughs> I don't know, some some musical or something. <laughs> that's so funny. No, not Pippin. Okay. Yeah, but that sounds cool, too. No, you were, you were a punk kid, eh? Yeah, well, I was an everything kid. I was, like, a anything that... I was a bit rebellious. Like I liked Dookie and I also liked Missy Elliott because like nobody in my school was like listening to Missy Elliott. The So Addictive album was like one of the most formative for me. You too. Yeah. Nice. That was like, that really made me like inform the way I think about word, the way that words fit together and stuff. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, Missy Elliott is like your writing inspiration now? A huge still? influence for sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. On like syllables and like how they tumble out of your mouth. Like mm. her command of that is hugely formative for she me. She can use consonants like no one else. I right? Feel like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, da, 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 da. yeah totally. Okay, and she cool. celebrates like the sound of words and fitting them together. And I think like that's. Yeah, that's such a temple of good writing. See, that's why I feel like your record is so mature in a way, because you do that. Even actually hearing you play the songs tonight and hearing you play around with certain parts and like, Mm. do you like Leon Redbone in any way? Do I like? (laughs) Leon Redbone? Because you're kind of doing these like these vocal pattern cool. things that are they're very old timey. I you're, like you're that. I appreciate this. it. Oh, thanks. It's cool. I've heard you mention that it's nice to play your own music too because you can extend certain chords. Like you're not stuck to the theater format of a song. But exactly. Yeah. Are you still playing with that? Like, are songs taking new shape every night? Every time. Yeah, mm. for sure. Every time. Every time, especially like with the live band stuff, they're always different because we go on excursions and, and things get weird. And then also, so <laughs> yeah, it's so fun. And solo too. Yeah. They're always, they're always, always, always different. Have you started writing for a next batch of recordings possibly? Yeah. Are you always sitting on a bunch of songs? Are you that type of person? No, but when the need arises for sure. And I have a few that like are starting to cook and I'm sort of starting to think about what the next thing might, might be. So I need time, uh, I need like time to not think about anything else to really devote to that. But there's yeah. ideas for sure. The way you did this record, even you took off to just jump in, right? France and Spain. I heard, I've heard you say, yeah. Where else did you go? I went to Portugal for a while. Awesome. I had no apartment. Like I didn't, I wasn't like I was paying rent somewhere and I was like on vacation. I was really just like, oh, I don't have an apartment anywhere when I left Philadelphia. You did it. I super did it because it was like so expensive to live in Toronto and it was like cheaper to go to Airbnbs in Paris for a month. And then my old professor had a donkey farm in France that she invited me to come visit. And I was like, (laughs) absolutely. Sounds great. So I lived with her for a couple of weeks and then, you know, extended stays. Like I did a, I did a long stay in Lisbon and really like, I just, every day I would wake up write, go for a walk, write, go for another walk, sit with my guitar until the middle of the night, and then maybe like go get a glass of wine somewhere and then do it all again the next day. So it was very good for focus. And I kind of just disappeared myself from 
everything from uh, humanity. Would like, you feel like you need to do to sort of create? At that time, for I like sure. That. I don't know if I need that again to create the next. I'm a bit terrified that I do, and I don't know how I'm going to get that now that my life looks different than it did then. Hmm. But we'll see. I can't control that. So, Wealthy benefactors. That's... <laughs> That's what I need. Mm-hmm. Do you know any? Yeah. Hey, hey, somebody out there, take it to Greece to write an <laughs> album. I think that'll work. I don't need much. I live very, very small. <laughs> so small. Oh, good one. Ah, uh, well, I... I walked Good into one. It. No, but I, when I was working on this, I lived in a studio apart, like a tiny sublet studio apartment in Toronto that was like, I could touch all four walls and my bed pulled out from the couch and the couch was the office and it was the gym and, and it was the kitchen and, you know. Like, and your walls much. were covered in lyrics, I yeah, heard? Yeah, yeah. So it was a psych ward, basically, is what you lived in. That's honestly what it felt like some of the time, for <laughs> sure. How did you live like that? Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, it was like I really let myself go. Was there. anyone worried about you? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm sure. How do you th- How do you feel you fared through the pandy? The pandy. That's I, cute. <laughs> I credit that to Taggart and Torrance. That's not mine. <laughs> Thank goodness I had the focus of making this music for through it for sure. Okay. I really used it. I really used the solitude to do the thing that I felt like I needed to do. Hmm. I was really scared most of the time. There was like one p- period of time that I really thought that I was, I had like, I had, su- I had struggled with panic attacks like earlier in my 30s and in radio too. Like it was a thing at the beginning of my radio career that I sort of had to work through. Um, and they came back in a big way during that time. There was like a little time period, this is a deep confession, but there was a little time period where I was like really sure that I was going to die like wow. imminently. And I called my cousin, who, Susie, who's like really beloved, who I mentioned already. She's an artist and, and one of my closest people. And I told her that. And she was like, well, if you think that you're going to die, you better figure out what's going to happen with your creative material. You better record all of your songs as demos and uh, put them somewhere that people can find them. Because, uh, you know, if you're going to die, then you should do that. And it gave me a focus. And for the few days that I was like having this pretty like deep mental health dive I recorded a bunch of demos and I made sure that all of the songs that I had written were like in a file somewhere hmm. and they are and it was very useful because it just I didn't spoiler alert like I, I didn't and, <laughs> and, but anybody who's <laughs> anybody who's struggled yeah. with like panic attack stuff knows that that feeling is so real it's so real and it's like so imminent yeah. and um Having a focus through it was for sure life-saving. Is that the piece of advice you feel like you needed to hear too? Someone say, get your art down then. Yeah. Don't waste your time. Because a more, I don't want to say normal, like a more, she's really unconventional and really beautiful person. And anybody who is, uh, any other person than Susie might have been like, it's going to be okay. Or like, can I come (laughs) give you a hug? Let me drop off some tea. And like, that's all really nice stuff. But for me at that time, the most useful thing was like, all right, man, well, do what you got to do. Do some art. Fucking keep moving. Yeah. It was good. I I think about that a lot because Jimmy Rogers is like someone musically that I think about a lot. And he had TB while he did his most famous recordings. Oh my God. Live yeah. down in between every take. Yeah. But the, obviously there was someone really gross pushing him the whole time too, being like, hurry up and record so I can make money off oh of you. Oh my God. Yeah. But yeah, I think about that a lot in the legacy thing. And now I heard something recently that I thought was amazing. I think it was Dominic Monaghan on, on Q actually. Who said uh, the scariest thing he could think of was that, can you name your grandfather's grandfather? Oh. The idea that three generations from now, nobody will know who you are. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's, it is really scary. It's freaky. But to me, it's like exciting. It's like a license to do whatever you want with your life. Totally. Totally. It's kind of peaceful, too. Because mm. it's like, yeah, it really matters what you do. And it also absolutely doesn't matter. That's exactly what So Small is about. It's like you're the whole universe and you're also absolutely nothing. I love that. Yeah. I'd love that. It's not my idea. That comes from like all sorts of ancient texts and scriptures and different like places and religions and whatnot. But did you were you did you dig through a lot of that stuff when you were writing your own songs? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Have that have those kind of texts always meant something to you anyway? Have you always dug through historical stories and 
Yeah, I was raised like I went to Hebrew school when I was a kid. Okay, learned a lot of Old Testament stuff and a lot of story. And I always just loved the I loved a good story, and I loved reading commentary on stories and hearing people argue about what different stories meant, which there's a lot of in in Judaism. Like there's a lot of like texts that are just like rabbis arguing all night about how to <laughs> interpret a text. Yeah, yeah. And it's so awesome because it. it's just like you get there's all this documentation of just like how people think about things, which I love. But yeah. And then I read a lot of, a lot of Western interpretations of Buddhist thinking during the pandemic, and that's also the basis for a lot of this stuff, like the ideas of, um, like Pema Chodron's interpretations of things, and Tara Brock and Joseph Goldstein, some of those like heroes of of, yeah, bringing Buddhist concepts to, to. Western audience. I don't like mm-hmm. using the term Western. That's why I hesitated. Like, I don't know what I mean by that to, to people who are not. Tasty people. <laughs> yeah. That's what, that's what we all need. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. To people who are but, far away from the source material, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So reading a lot of that mm. stuff t- too. And, and, you know. Do you consider yourself a spiritual person? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you? Is, yeah. Wow. Thanks for turning it around. Nobody ever does that. Um, You're yeah. a very deep person, obviously. Yeah. I consider myself spiritual, but. It, not to any particular religion. I just, I'm very into the stars and the dust of it all. I like that. So yes. And again, I mentioned this before the show, but fungi. I legitimately think fungi is such an important part of our random existence. Mm-hmm. So yes. Do you think about the the well of songs and the well of creativity? Yeah. Do you see it as like a like a a milky way that goes by that you have to sort of dip into or that you have to calm down to tap into? Yes. You do. Kind of, yeah. Uh-huh. Like the like we all kind of have access to this creative commons that's out there. We all have access to whatever the like floaty ideas are. It sort of takes the pressure out. It's not you. Like Elizabeth Gilbert explained this very well in a famous TED talk that she gave about her own success and trying to with Eat Pray Love and like the pressure she felt to replicate it. And she went back to the idea that like the word genius comes from this ancient concept. I think in Rome, I might be getting it wrong. Don't please fact check me if I'm wrong, but that, that the idea was not that you were a genius, but that you had a genius who is this being outside of yourself who could communicate to you. So it like takes the ego out of it. It's like, it's not like Mm -hmm. I'm this genius person who has to think of these ideas. It's like, actually, no, I have access to a thing. And if I can, do the things I need to do to tap into that well, then then I can have access and it's my job to do the work of like translating it or to put in the editing time, but it's not, I'm not the source. Wow. Um, and I think of it that way. I only think of it that way for sure. Do you think of yourself as a vessel? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And you have like the filter, like all the filters that I have are built from my life experiences and things that have touched me or things that are, you know, deeply encoded in my genes from my ancestors. And that's the filter through which... I can channel these things, but they're not mine for sure. I love that. Yeah. That's amazing. Do you feel that way about your own writing? I, yes, but sometimes it feels contrived. Like it feels like a lot of work sometimes sure. to tap into things. But I do you have any, like, I feel like I've developed certain, certain habits that can get me back into the brain space. Uh, and microdosing helps, I must say. Oh, yeah? Uh, I On LSD or mushrooms? Mushrooms. I, I like psilocybin is kind of my thing. I've never dabbled in LSD. I would, yeah. And mainly I started doing it to stop smoking. Good one. But then I found creative, creatively, it gave me space and, again, freed you from that judging yourself and, like, the idea of a bad idea, you know? Just write it out. See if it's bad. Yeah. But exactly. I, th- I think you're so right that writing bad songs is healthy. You have to get, it am- get them ha- out of the way. You have to. And if you're scared of writing bad ones, then you could for sure never write good ones. <laughs> <laughs> Will you play me a good song? I don't know if I have any good songs, but I won't, I'll I, play you a song. What song is it on your record that you end with you, you speaking, you whispering into the microphone. It's like this Jimi Hendrix style ending. Oh. <laughs> is that nobody? Or the one that that's at the very end? Or the one that... It's in the middle of the record. Oh, that's probably Bring... nobody. Yeah. I, yeah, where are you going? Oh, no, that's Narrow Bridge. Black yes. Car, White Car, Black Car. What a beautiful car. song. Thanks. Black, that's what you're saying? Black Car, White Car? Yeah. Okay. Black Car and a White Car and a Beige House and a Brown House. 
<clears throat> it's psychedelic. Mm, well, thanks. That was a that was a strong choice on a record to whisper into people's ear at the end of a song. <laughs> that was came really from the panic attack uh, really? phase of things. Yeah, 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 for sure. And actually, the song uh, I'll play it for you now because that's a good. That's you've set it up well. It. Um, panic attacks like feel like there, there's something I don't know if anybody's had one but there's like you get into a you've had yeah so I know it's different for everyone but you get into a brain loop that you can't get out of and there's something like weirdly meditative about being in a brain loop even if it's a bad scary one um and so I wrote this song like to me the most relaxing meditative meter is a waltz like one nice. two three one two three Three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But I wrote this song um, in 11, which is a busted waltz. So it goes like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one. So you can't really catch your breath. But there also becomes something like weirdly meditative about that, too. Show me love Show me where it hurts Promise I Promise I won't tell you Someone else has had it worse Catch it now Coming down the edges of your measured mouth and drip drop aching to be heard didn't you try to outrun your insights
you. Thank you. I I want to say thank you for doing this all together. <laughs> thank you for taking a chance on the show. Thanks for coming out to Halifax too. Uh, thanks for answering my email when I emailed you and I was like, hi, Zach, can I please be on your podcast? I <laughs> fell off my chair. I think my wife will attest that I was like, you won't believe who sent me a message. Yeah. I really like your show and I wanted to be part of it. So thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you. Yeah. You got to come yeah. up to the end. Hey, thank you. Yeah, Zach, thank you, guys. Great. You're a new listener. You're a new listener. You're a new listener. You're all taking home a podcast tonight. <laughs> um... Next time you come back, you'll definitely have to come out to the Annapolis Valley where, where happily, I'm living. Happily. It's very lovely up there. Is there anywhere else you get to see while you're in the province? I mean, I went to the South Shore and did a show in Riverport, and I loved that. And now I've only got a couple more days here, but I'll be back in the summer. So oh, do some... yeah. Are you on the festival circuit this summer at all? I'm doing some festivals in the States, and then I'm coming here for my own enjoyment some Weird. family, I know, in uh, in August, but I'm gonna hopefully book some shows around that, so I'll keep you keep nice. you all posted. Mm-hmm. Oh, good to know, good yeah. to know. Yeah. And then, are you uh, are you gonna do like a CD release show in France or Spain at all? Oh my Considering... god, I would love that. Again, we're looking for that benefactor to send me to France nice. or Spain. Yeah. That'll be great. You heard it here first. <laughs> but I am gonna do a release show in in Philly at the end of May, which I'm really cool. excited about because I haven't been back since I left and I lived there, and that's gonna be really fun. Is it a second home for you? Do you like? Like, do you have a hat everywhere in the world at this point, do you feel? I don't know. But I do feel grateful to feel welcome most places. Like, most places I've been, I've been like, wow, people are nice here. I'd love to come back. You're so outgoing and nice, though. That's oh. why. <laughs> I've heard you talk to complete strangers tonight, and I was like, oh, she must know them really wow. well. <laughs> I don't know. I like people a lot, so. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, thank you again. I want to... I want to say thank you to the audience. Yeah, thank you huge thank you all so much us. for coming out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thanks. You did a wonderful job, Zach. You made this such a joy, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. We'll just do another episode when the next album comes out, or when you come back. Who knows? Sounds good. Awesome. Um, how do you want to play yourself out? Play myself out? Yeah. You don't have to like walk off stage while like chicken picking or anything. But Do you want to hear one more song? Do you want to hear one more song? Yeah, I would love that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I really do want to play you guys this one because it has a special Halifax connection. Um, Uh And I'll leave you with this one. It's kind of a hopeful song, hopefully. Um, Both of my... uh, Is that okay? Do I play myself out with a tune? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Yeah, I'm requesting this one from myself. (laughs) Uh, Both my grandparents uh, on my father's side survived the Holocaust and my... Um, they met towards the end of the war and they gave birth to my aunt in a deportation camp in Germany. And then after almost three years, they got the chance to come to Canada. And my Baba, my grandmother, was really scared of crossing the ocean on a boat. And she had this baby with her and she had just survived the unimaginable. And the ship was swerving from side to side, and the journey was really treacherous. Um, And she made her daughter this promise that if the waters rose and tried to overtake the boat, that she would just hold her really high over her head, and she would be saved. And I wanted to tell you that tonight, because where they arrived was here in Halifax um, at Pier 21. Um, And that's why I exist, and and that's... um, that's it. So I wrote this song uh, in her honor. I know you are tired and scared to close your eyes. I'll keep watch until we reach the ocean's other side. Then I'll lay beside
Long before the thought of you ever occurred to me A new day came from darkness The sea released the land And we were born a promise To the palm of mercy's hand So if water Great unknown, I will hold you high and I will see you, I will see you home. They were ours to keep And fill your pockets With a light That you could always see No matter the leaving No matter the fear No matter how hard they try My love, we are here So if water Great unknown, I will hold you high and I will see you, I will see you and if waters rise to great unknown, I will hold you Keep it going for Talia Slinger, everybody. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you for having me, Zach. Thank you. And thank you to Good Robot for hosting. Yeah. Hey, Good Robot. Do you have like a jingle? Like, do 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 Zach?